In this video, I would like to go through the features of the HTTP client in IntelliJ. So um, the HTTP client in IntelliJ is simply a, a tool that lets you make HTTP requests from within IntelliJ. Uh, it is very similar to Postman in that regard, except that in the IntelliJ HTTP client, uh, we create our HTTP requests as just plain text files. Whereas in um, IntelliJ, I'm sorry, in Postman, we have a graphical interface for creating those that request. So if you are a programmer, you'll feel right at home creating a HTTP requests in this tool because it is no different from writing plain text files. Um, before I continue, just want to make something uh, very clear in that this feature is only available in the paid Intel JetBrains products. Uh, this includes IntelliJ Ultimate, PyCharm, and RubyMine, uh, and many other of their products. Um, so let's start. Um, what I did was to prepare for this uh, video, I created a simple Flask uh, API, API server. And uh, it has a few endpoints, as you can see here. And these endpoints, we'll be using these endpoints to go through the, multi the features of the uh, IntelliJ HTTP client. Okay, so let's make our first request. Um, let's make a request that hits the hello world endpoint, as you can see here. Uh, this endpoint in Flask, if you do not specify a HTTP method, by default it's GET. So the way we do that, the way we make a request, is we simply create a text file with a HTTP extension. So we can either use this, um, this, this button here, or we can use, we're going to simply create a file and just give it a HTTP extension. So in the HTTP client, you can either specify the extension .HTTP, or the extension .rest, whichever you prefer. Uh, usually, I just use uh, .http. So let me give the name of the file, which is test.http. Okay. So um, like I said earlier, the um, HTTP requests are just plain text files. So because they are plain text files, we get all the tools that IntelliJ makes available to us for editing text files. So this includes uh, code formatting, uh, all the, uh, if you're using the Vim plugin, you can use IdeaVim. Uh, it has support for showing you the structure, uh, version control, etc. So this is one already one benefit that it has over Postman in that you can use very mature tools for manipulating your HTTP requests. So the IntelliJ HTTP client syntax uh, takes inspiration from the actual way that HTTP requests look on the wire. So let me show an example. Um, let's say that we want to hit the endpoint just now. So the endpoint was um, forward slash hello world. So we simply specify the HTTP method, which is get, and the URL. So HTTP localhost and 5000. Hello world. Okay, so what we do is we just you can see that there is this green button, green arrow on the on in the gutter of the editor. So if we just press that, it will run execute that h. It will just execute that HTTP request. So as you can see here, there's an error, and the reason for this error is because I did not restart my server. So let's start up the server right here. Okay, the server has started, as you can see here, and let us start, let us execute the HTTP request. Okay, so as you can see here, it executes a HTTP request. Uh, you can see the response headers here, and we see the response body uh, below it. Um, in the case of GET, because GET is the default, um, specifying the HTTP method is actually optional. So we can just specify the 
URL and it will actually do the same thing. There. So as you can see, just specifying the URL, we achieve the same thing. Um, so let's move on. Now we've, we've seen how get looks like. Let us uh, look now look at how post requests look like. So in my API here, I have an endpoint called greeting form. And this endpoint, um, and this endpoint um, accepts a H, uh, is a, uses the HTTP method post. So it uses um, form URL encoding. Okay. Uh, for its response for its request body. So let's look at that very quickly. Um, because we're using post, we have to specify post. And the endpoint just now was greeting form. Go host 5000 greeting form. And because we are expecting it um, to be sent to the server in the form of a form, we need to specify the content type. So the content type would be form encoding. So it's this one here, application URL form encoding. So like I said earlier, since we're using uh, IntelliJ, we get all the benefits, uh, of, we get all of IntelliJ's experience and uh, facilities for editing text. So in this case, you can see that it has auto-completion for the content types, okay? So we use, um, when we submit forms, um, uh, over the web, uh, the content type that the browser places is, is this one here, application xww form URL encoded. Okay. Now this is where IntelliJ is slightly weaker than Postman, in that it does not help you build this request. You actually have to build the body of the request yourself. In the case of Postman, when you're doing form submission, it gives you a nice table for you to put the key value pairs. So in this case we have to build the key value pairs ourselves. So in this case, uh, the URL parameters is na uh, our name is just name. So let's specify name and let's give a value for uh, Bob. So if this works, we should get a response, hello Bob, exclamation mark. So let's press the green arrow and what do we get there? As you can see, we get hello Bob, okay? So that is for, uh, form URL encoded um, request bodies. But in the age of um, REST APIs, it's far more common for us to have JSON request bodies. So let's look at how we would do the same for a JSON request body. So I have this other endpoint here, greeting. It's HTTP method is also post. and But in this case, it's is expecting a JSON request body, okay? And it's also expecting a name uh, attribute inside that JSON body. So let's see what how we can do this using the IntelliJ HTTP client. So the end, we use post because we're using the post method here. And the endpoint is greeting, so we specify localhost 5000 greeting. So the content type should be JSON. So there. And what's cool about JSON is that, what's cool about IntelliJ, sorry, is that it supports something called language injections. So in this case, uh, language injections means that we have a language inside of another language. So in this case, we will have JSON within the HTTP syntax, okay? So let us type some JSON. So we put name. And box. so as you can see, it has syntax highlighting for the JSON body, request body. Okay, so let's press the green arrow again to run it. And you can see that it returns message, hello, Bob. Okay, so what's cool is that because of language injection, if I were to select code, uh, reformat code, it would format the JSON nicely. Okay, because it, it, um, IntelliJ is aware that the body is JSON, so it knows how to format that nicely. Um, if it was, if the request body was XML, um, IntelliJ would be able to do the same thing. Okay, so that is an example of uh, language injection inside of uh, uh, the IntelliJ HTTP client. Um, so I I I miss one point here in that. 
in one .http file, we can have multiple requests. And those requests would be separated by these three, three pound or hash signs. Okay, so just like in Postman, where one collection can have multiple HTTP requests, in this case, in the case of the IntelliJ client, we can also have multiple HTTP requests. We just need to separate them using three pound characters. Okay. Now, um, another feature uh, which comes um, from the fact that we're using IntelliJ is that if we were to press F1, uh, next to a header, we would get help for that header. So let's press F1, and there, as you can see, it tells us the content type enti entity header is used to indicate the media type of the resource. Okay, so we get the IntelliJ help there as well. Okay, so let's hide that. Um, sometimes our HTTP requests. Uh, body might be very big and if it's very big what we can do is we can instead of putting the HTTP request body in line within the editor we can place it in a separate file so let's create a separate file and let's call it file and we call it call it greeting bob.json and let's press enter the uh, Bob's name, uh, the request body there, and let us then try to make the same request but using a um, a request body from a file. So we specify greeting, and we specify JSON like we did just now, and now instead of specifying the request body, we put a less than sign and then we specify the file. Okay, so in this case, the file is greeting Bob JSON. Okay, so let's run that now and let's see what happens. And as you can see, we get the same result. Okay, so this is useful when we want to reuse the same body multiple times or we want to um, keep our, or if the JSON body is too large, for example. Okay, let's continue by talking about uh, variables. So one of the most useful features of Postman is that it supports variables. So um, the IntelliJ HTTP client uh, does so too. You just need to create a file called HTTP client env.json. So HTTP client env.json. Okay. So inside this JSON file, um, uh, at the root, you would have the name of your environments or whatever category you have. So in this case, for example, let's say we have a dev environment, okay? So in the dev environment, we have our host, the host of our API server, and we call the host 127.0.1, okay? Because it's our local machine. Uh, then in our test environment, for example, we might give it a host of test.example.com, okay? So now, uh, instead of hard coding the host here, what we do is we ju just like with Postman, we just do double curly brace and host. Okay, so um, it has autocomplete. The IntelliJ will detect when we create uh, that environment file, and it will detect the keywords, and it will allow us to add it just like that. Okay, so now when we run this endpoint, IntelliJ will tell us to choose which environment we want to run it in. So if I run it in dev, it hits it with localhost. And if I run it in the test environment, it hits test.example.com. Okay. So let's do another thing. For example, let's uh, parameterize Bob. So let's say name. So in the dev environment, the name, we will set it to Bob. And maybe in the test environment, we can give it the name Alice. Okay, so in this case, let's change this to, and remember it has autocomplete, so we just use name. So if we were to run it in the dev environment, we should get hello Bob. There, hello Bob. But if we were to run it in the test environment, 
we should see hello Alice. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, um, so another very useful feature is um, that just like with other languages supported by IntelliJ, the HTTP language um, supports live templates. So for example, if you forget the syntax for creating a GET request, you can just write GTR and it will help you to build a GET request. So in this case, we can specify our server. So in this case, we specify host. And our endpoint is uh, hello world. And that we'll just leave it like that. And we press run with the test environment. And there you go. Oh, sorry, forgot to specify the port. Okay. So in the case of um, in the case of get request, it doesn't help us that much, but in the case of doing a file upload, um, it helps us a great deal because for file upload, there are a lot more uh, things to set. So to demo file upload, um, I have an endpoint here um, called upload. Okay, so upload accepts a single file, and then it will save that file that was uploaded to the uploads directory. Okay, so. The endpoint is upload. So if we want to create a API request that has a file upload component, we just use um, the live template fptr um, host. We use host host, and the port is five thousand. Then we press enter, and we specify upload. Okay. So the field name uh, is file. And the file that we're uploading is this photo1.jpg. So we specify the name photo1jpg, photo1jpg. And here is where we need to include the file. So, um, so we specify photo1jpg. Okay. So the file that is uploaded. Uh, will be this file. So it has autocomplete as you can see here any file that is You can specify any file in that directory. So in this case, I'm specifying photo one JPEG um, This less than side is what signifies that we are sending that file to the server. Okay um, We just press this button and let's say we do it in the dev environment and There we get file uploaded and as you can see the file is here It's uploaded to that directory so this is where live templates come in very handy. Um, uh, another very useful feature of IntelliJ is that um, okay. Next, let's look at the uh, support for running JavaScript after HTTP requests. Um, so this is useful for cases such as unit testing, um, as well as for setting uh, the value of environment variables um, after requests have completed. So for example, let's say we create a new resource and we would like uh, to use the ID of the newly created resources resource in subsequent requests. So we can do that very easily using the JavaScript support. Um, so let's look at a simple example now. Um, let's go back to our greeting example. So in our greeting example, um, we sub. Okay, let's do this. Host five thousand greeting, and it accepted JSON. So JSON, and last time we give it a name of Bob. Okay, so let's just run this to make sure that it's still working. And there we get hello Bob. Okay, so now um, let's look at how we can add JavaScript that will run after this request has completed. So the way we do so is we create a greater than sign. And after the greater than sign, we include these 
uh, curly brace and percentage sign as the separator. Okay, so within this block here, we can add JavaScript. Okay, All right. So within this block, the JavaScript has access to two very important um, variables. Okay, so or objects. So this these objects are one client. Okay, so this client object. Um, supports uh, things like unit tests, uh, assertions, logging, and setting, getting global variables, okay? Um, the second thing, the second object provided to JavaScript code is response. So response allows us to get the details about the response. So this includes the response body, the status code, headers, and um, headers, and let me check one more thing. Response dot. What else do we have here? Okay, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, just the body status code and headers. Okay. Um, so let's first look at how we would log something. So for example, let's say that I want to log the response body, okay? So the way I would do that is I would just do client.log and I would put response.body, okay? So what's interesting in the IntelliJ HTTP client is that um, when it gets a response of type JSON, it will automatically convert that to a JavaScript object. So let's see that in action now. So run with dev environment. Okay, so now um, you see that it adds two additional uh, tabs here, okay? So because our um, JavaScript here is not within a unit test, um, we won't see the output in, in test results, okay? There are no unit tests here. But instead, we'll see the output here. So see, as you can see, it automatically converts it to a JavaScript object because the response, as you can see here, is of type JSON, okay? So now let's, uh, as you can see, um, we did not convert the object to a string, so we're not able to see the detail. So let's convert the object to a string, okay? Stringify, and let's see what happens. So there, and there, as you can see in the output, it shows the um, hello ball, okay? So just to make things even clearer, let's add response from, let's add some text in the beginning, response from server, plus that. Okay, and let's have a look, and there, okay? So, um, so that illustrates uh, logging as well as getting at the response body, okay? So if the response body is was JSON, then it is automatically converted to a JavaScript object. Um, so now let's look at um, writing unit tests. So one JavaScript block can have multiple unit tests. So the way to define a unit test is just to use the client object's um, test function. So we need to give the unit test a name. So for example, check the status code. And we also need to give the unit test a function. So this is the function that will validate that this condition uh, was passed or not, okay? So within the unit test, we can create assertions. So the way to do that is just to do client.assert and write the condition. So for example, in this case, we want to check that the status um, was 200, so we check it like that. And to help with debugging, uh, just in case this status is uh, false, we can put uh, a message here, uh, which will get printed out if the condition is not met, okay? So we put here status should be, sorry, this should be response dot status. So status should be 200, okay? So let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so 
uh, response handler that message is still there but now under tests you should see one unit test which is check the status and they're all green arrows because it was correct okay so now let's force an error so for example let's force a 404 error on the server so let's put la 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 okay and let's run it again and we should get an error okay there so the response code was 404 so now that unit test should fail and when that unit test fails we see the message um, that was given to the assert function okay All right so let's fix that back again and let's run it okay so now as you can see the test uh, succeeded now okay so you can have multiple tests so for example let's say that um, we want uh, to check the message okay so the message in this case is hello Bob right so let's say check message right so in this case let's see the unit test and we can do client dot assert response dot body dot message is equal to hello Bob okay and message should read um, message should greet Bob should have greeting for Bob okay so now let's run this and let's see what happens and there it's successful again so now we have two unit tests and it is successful okay um, another thing that it supports is um, so this is unit testing uh, another very useful feature of uh, the HTTP client is that you can set variables from JavaScript. So this is very useful, for example, when you are creating uh, a resource and the server returns a resource ID and you want to use that resource ID subsequently in uh, future requests, okay? So the way to do that is you can set the um, variable. So for example, let's say that we want to create a counter, um, a counter and uh, each time this request is made, we want to increment that counter, okay? So the way to do that is we need to first get the value of the initial counter. So we do var counter is equal to that. Then let's say, so this is how you get the value of the counter. So if the counter isn't set, we can set the counter to zero. Then we can increment the counter. And then we can set back the value of the counter. And let's print the value of the counter here. So client.log counter. Okay. So now let's run this request and let's see what happens. Uh, oh no, there's a mistake in my. Oh, okay. I forgot to put counter here. Okay. So let's run that again. Okay. So if we look at the response handler, we should see one there. So now let's. Let's run it again, and what happens? And we should see two, yep. And let's run it again, and we should see three, yep, okay. So this counter variable is now use, usable just like the environment variables, like host, uh, we can see here. So let's say that we want to include that in the response body, okay? I mean, request body. So we can just put counter like this. So it will autocomplete because it knows that counter is now in a variable okay so let's run it and now you can see that it will send bob3 so when it greets it will say hello bob3 okay but as you can see now our unit test fails because it's expecting hello bob okay so what we can do here is um, we can um, what we can do here is we can get the value of the counter in the unit test and we can just append it to the unit test okay plus counter and i think okay so because this code will run first so the counter would have been incremented uh, by the time uh, the unit test runs. So we have to give the previous value of the counter. So it should be counter minus one. Okay. So let's do this. What happens? And now all the unit tests pass. Okay. 
So that's pretty much it for the JavaScript support. Uh, it's more or less equivalent to what Postman provides. All right, uh, next I want to talk about uh, request history. So IntelliJ uh, will store the last 50 requests in, um, in the request history so we can um, look at uh, the past requests that we made. Um, so the way to do that is you can go to Tools, uh, HTTP Client, Show HTTP Request History, like this, or there's also a, an, a button um, here. You can see the clock here. So click on clock, that clock and you'll see the history as well. So as you can see, um, um, previously we hit the greeting endpoint with Bob and you can see that the placeholders aren't there. Okay. So if you want to see the response, we just press on the command button uh, and then we highlight this file here and we'll go to the response. Okay. So let's try that again. All right. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, support for authentication. So um, let's have a look at the sample API created. So in the sample API, uh, you can have a look here that I configured some basic authentication, right? So um, let's look at the endpoint which supports, which requires basic auth. Mm, okay, so this is the endpoint, resource protected. So resource protected is protected using basic auth. Okay, so the username is admin and the password is admin123. So in order to hit this API using um, IntelliJ, what we can do is we can just type get uh, HTTP localhost is running on port 5000 um, and then resource protect. Okay, and we just run, press the run button here. Okay. Okay, sorry, the server isn't running, so let's run the server first. Uh, let's run the server. Okay. Okay, now the server is running. Uh, let's hit the endpoint again. And as you can see, we get unauthorized, right? So it's very easy for us to access this resource. All we have to do is specify authorization. Uh, sorry, basic. And the username was admin, and then the password was admin123. So let's run this, and we should get back something other than uh, 401. Okay, so we get 200, and it says hello admin. Okay. Um, another common scenario is when we authenticate and the server returns a cookie. And then in subsequent requests, we want that cookie to be passed as well. So let's look at um, let's look at the a, a sample endpoint that uh, is protected using cookies. So in this case, we have a login endpoint, okay. And this login endpoint, we check for the username admin and the password admin, right? And if the username and password is correct, it will set something in the session. So it will check. It will set. Um, admin you will set the username in the session okay <clears throat> so first let's uh, try accessing the profile endpoint and see what happens so let's do a get http localhost 5000 and profile okay so let's see what happens so we should get an error of some sort okay so we get an internal server error because i didn't do such good error checking right so, because um, there will be no key uh, with username, so you get internal sub error. Uh, the Python code here would have thrown an exception. Okay, so just uh, as a quick workaround, let's just uh, let's just log in successfully, and after logging in, then uh, let's hit the profile endpoint again. Okay, so the login endpoint. Let's create a login endpoint, and HP look. Let's hit the login endpoint. And that's uh, the content type is JSON. 
and the username and the key required username admin password admin okay so that's what happens here let's run it oh sorry it should be post post and let's run it <coughs> and it says status okay so at this point uh, a session should exist on the server and a cookie should have been returned uh, so you can you can see here that the server returned the cookie okay because i modified the session attribute so the server would have returned the cookie back to the client okay so uh, now when we hit the profile endpoint again we should see um, something like this okay so username admin okay because it pulled admin from uh, the session okay now um, IntelliJ what happens is um, when you make a request and if the request if the response contains a cookie um, IntelliJ will store the cookie in this file so HTTP client dot cookies okay uh, so as you can see we, because we turn a cookie and uh, that's what that's what you get you get the session ID there okay um, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover for this video um, I, if uh, I just want to highlight um, some disadvantages of the HTTP client. Um, Postman, uh, one advantage of Postman is that it, con it includes a um, command line runner called Newman. So at the moment, the IntelliJ HTTP client does not support the equivalent, something like that. There is already an issue in the IntelliJ um, issue tracker uh, requesting for this feature, but there's no timeline. JetBrains has given no timeline for when uh, it will be released. Um, the second disadvantage, of course, is that it is only in the paid uh, JetBrains products. So for those of you who are on a budget, there is something uh, very, very similar to this uh, tool, but uh, implemented as an extension uh, for Visual Studio Code. So that is um, this particular tool, um, the REST client. And as you can see, it's extremely similar. Okay. Um, the thing that's missing from this particular tool is that it doesn't support uh, running JavaScript uh, after um, requests. Okay, so it doesn't support the JavaScript syntax. But there is a uh, command line runner for this, unlike the uh, IntelliJ client. And that command line runner does support uh, running JavaScript after requests. Okay. Um, okay. So that's pretty much uh, everything that I want to talk about during this video. Um, if you have any comments, uh, if you if there's something that I missed out or something you just you didn't like, please um, feel free to um, feel free to drop a comment. Um, and thank you very much.